As one may have expected, given my recent video where an AI reviewed Sonic 2, now it's my turn to give my thoughts on the game. Sonic 2 was the first game I ever owned as a kid. I got it with my Genesis, along with Virtual Pinball, Cosmic Spacehead, and Radical Rex. I really enjoyed all of these games, but Sonic 2 still ended up being the one I played the most. I've enjoyed Sonic 2 ever since then, and for a long time, it was my favorite Sonic game. But as an adult, and with a much greater understanding of game design under my belt than I had when I was 5 years old, does Sonic 2 hold up as the masterpiece so many fans of the series say it is? Before Mania released, I'd say the split between people who thought Sonic 3 and Knuckles was the best and Sonic 2 was the best was pretty even. But does that split make sense? Well, on the one hand, I can certainly see how people come to the conclusion that Sonic 2 is a better game. It's much more tightly focused than Sonic 1, has a much greater emphasis on momentum and flow, looks better, sounds better, has more zones, and added a ton of content from Tails the Fox to a multiplayer mode, and even Super Sonic. On the other hand, Sonic 2 has a really confused idea of difficulty. Some pretty questionable special stage design still has some pretty lame boss design, mechanical inconsistencies, and more. So let's start with the additions and changes then. Sonic 2's core structure is technically the same as the first game. However, Sonic himself now has an additional move in the form of the spin dash. As the name implies, this allows you to rev up on the spot and then shoot off in ball form. This affords the player a quick burst of speed and is easily the best addition Sonic's arsenal has ever had. Sonic without the spin dash feels naked and weak. Beyond this, Sonic now has a friend that can tag along, known as Miles Tails Prower. When in single player, Tails mimics the player's inputs for Sonic with a slight delay. He's effectively invincible and can do everything Sonic can do. You can also swap the AI out for a second player, though the screen will always focus on Sonic. Tails is unfortunately a burden if you don't have a human playing as him. He can be useful here and there, but more often than not he'll do things like hit bosses right as you were about to, meaning you'll fall straight through and into a hazard. He also gets in the way in the special stages, but we'll get to those in a bit. Now, the core level design in Sonic 2 is technically a massive improvement over the first game. There's a much greater focus on speedy hills, smooth terrain, and ramps. There are still bits of precision platforming, as there should be, but unlike something like Sonic 1 or Sonic CD, these usually flow in and out of the more momentum-focused sections. You won't run into levels like Marble Zone that are nothing but flat planes and stair-like platforms. As such, Sonic 2 feels diverse, open, and fast. On top of this, they stripped zones down into just two acts outside of a couple of exceptions, meaning you get more varied themes and a pace that feels sharper. However, Sonic 2's core platforming is let down almost entirely due to one choice. The obstacle placement. Now, I know what you may be thinking. You yourself have said before that obstacles aren't a bad thing in Sonic. Sonic is about earning and maintaining speed through momentum and flow. This is true. But obstacles need to be reactable, consistent, and preferably not beginner's traps. Sonic 2 regularly breaks all three of these rules. One example is at the beginning of Metropolis 1. This Asteron is perfectly set up to troll players who go for the shield first. You hit the shield, land on the button, and immediately the shield is taken. This may make sense in a way, but if you break it down, what it's really doing is punishing precision and accurate execution. You did the cool thing by comboing your jump into a bounce off the power-up and straight onto the button. So why are you punished for it? In Sonic 3 and Knuckles or Mania, landing on the button would have been the only way to narrowly avoid taking damage. The implication being they're still maintaining the trap, but making the cool choice is the way to get out unscathed. It would reward your gut reaction to speed things up, not punish it. Likewise, the beginning of Metropolis 2 straight up pushes you into a slicer, an enemy whose damage can't be protected against by rolling. 
Then there's this part at the start of Metropolis 3, where there's no way to know that there are spikes at the top of this ramp before you race up it. Or later on with the slicer at the top of these two big screws. Metropolis isn't the only offender by a long shot either. Whether it's the infamous inescapable pit, hidden enemies that pop out of geometry, or enemies that become invulnerable walls of pain in time with their initial spawn in relation to how long it takes the player to reach them. Meaning they'll almost always be invulnerable and hit you every time you get to them. The problem isn't that these things aren't technically avoidable and fair. They are, but what makes them bad design is that they punish playing the game the way it was intended, rather than challenge playing it the way it was intended. To avoid them requires playing the game slowly and tediously, with no flow, or else memorizing the entire game beforehand. Games like Sonic 3 and Knuckles or Sonic Mania still place obstacles in the way of the player as one would expect. But unlike Sonic 2, they like to use beginner's pranks rather than beginner's traps, if that makes sense. You don't run face first into spikes you couldn't see coming. You run into a spring that knocks you backwards, or changes your route to a less preferable one. The punishments of the beginner's traps in these games are lesser. They're about shifting your momentum in the moment, rather than just knocking rings out of you and killing you. They also very, very rarely use enemies that are completely invincible for a time, or that are covered in dangerous hitboxes, which Sonic 2 uses constantly. And even when they do, Sonic 3 also gives players the insta-shield which can deal with these enemies anyway. So many things in Sonic 2 feel perfectly timed to hit you and stop you in a way that just doesn't feel good until you've memorized it. And honestly, that's probably where this bad reputation this series has came from. It doesn't even stop there, since some enemies and traps can be inconsistent. Mashers are the perfect example of this. Sometimes Sonic intersects with their teeth first, meaning there's a decent chance you'll take damage even when you're rolling and there's a decent chance you won't. If I as the player can't do something to ensure consistency, how can I focus on maintaining proper flow? The issues with the core gameplay don't stop there. I ran into a few glitches like phasing through collision here. The worst one is these stupid foot accelerators in Wing Fortress though. I've known how to work these things for decades now at this point. But that doesn't mean their design isn't utterly backwards. When you touch one, they launch you forward. However, if you're holding forward when you hit it, you'll actually cancel the momentum of the device and slow Sonic way down. Not good when you can't do anything to get out of it, and these things hang out around bottomless pits. In a genre where holding left or right is the absolute standard, and in a game where they know most people will near constantly be holding that direction, even after using a set piece, why would you not fix such a glaring issue? Particularly right at the end of the game like this, it feels extremely cheap. Almost like it was intentional just to eat lives. It gets a little bit better with the bosses. They're much more creative than they were in Sonic 1, which is a huge improvement. But they're not really any more challenging. In fact, over half of them can be destroyed either before they even get close to hitting you or before they even get the chance to attack. None of them are particularly poorly designed, they're just not engaging. Though the final set of bosses really need to give the player a single ring. Even though I can do it just fine now, there's absolutely no reason why I should have to do the whole thing without getting hit once. Heck, at least just give players a shield if you feel a ring is too powerful. Though, personally, I found rings to be a frustrating issue in this game as well. Later Sonic games have consistent timing for when the player can start picking up rings again. Sonic 2 doesn't seem to be that way, and many rings fall through the geometry on top of that, meaning in certain sections you're bound to run out of rings if you get hit too much. Since Sonic really isn't about surviving obstacles in the same way other platformers are, that doesn't make much sense. That becomes a huge problem considering how important rings are toward getting into special stages, by the way. Unlike Sonic 1, the sequel sees you entering special stages through checkpoints, if the player has at least 50 rings. This allots you many more chances to nab Chaos Emeralds, and rewards exploring, kind of. 
This is good considering there are now seven Chaos Emeralds and the special stages are now kind of questionable in design. Now, I loved the half-pipe special stages as a kid, and part of me still really likes the concept, but the 2D nature of them here, tails, and the strict requirements of some of the later special stages really ruins them. Special stages themselves range from fun to torture. Stage 4 is where it starts to get hard, mostly because of the section where you have to slide between the line of single bombs in the middle. Stage 5 is actually easier, though it's not easy. Then stage 6 for some reason has some insanely strict ring requirements, and a set of bombs in the last section that you have no chance of avoiding on your first try, as well as some rings you have to know to jump preemptively to get. Stage 7 brings back the line of bombs from stage 4, with a high ring count in the first section. It then has an easier middle section, with the final section not being particularly difficult. Instead, the last section is fairly luck-based, with the rings scattered in a chaotic pattern, and the few bombs involved kind of coming out of nowhere, also with no real pattern. What's more, tails can really hamper your ability to succeed in the special stages. I've heard some people argue that he's not a big deal, since he doesn't actually lose any of the rings Sonic picks up when he gets hit. This is true. However, the problem is that I've had many instances where Tails gets in front of Sonic somehow, making the stage impossible to complete. As such, I usually play without Tails, because it's not worth the risk. Why is it not worth the risk? Well, what really kills the special stages is how they're accessed. As I said, you have to get 50 rings and then find a checkpoint, but firstly, these special stages are so difficult at times that you'd have to play this game a million times to really get them down consistently enough to get all of the emeralds in one playthrough without save state. What's more though, is that this way of entering them is completely at odds with how Sonic is designed to play. Getting into special stages means you have to baby Sonic through levels to find the 50 required rings, hold on to them by babying him, and then babying him until you find a checkpoint. You then have to hope you do well and finish the special stage, or you've wasted at that checkpoint, and have to recollect all 50 rings and search for another. Most checkpoints are separated between different routes, meaning you have to do slow and tedious exploration in order to get to them. You can't just blaze through the stage to the next checkpoint. Without save states, that probably would have taken me four or five straight playthroughs to get Super Sonic, which is stupid when you consider you can't keep him unlocked in the original game since it has no battery backup. Though, it's not like Super Sonic is particularly great in this game anyway. Many of these stages don't accommodate for him well, and once you've unlocked him, you're forced into using him once you jump with 50 rings. What's worse is that even if Super Sonic was universally useful, to get to him in each stage still requires babying Sonic, since Sonic 2 has so many traps designed to lose your rings if you go fast. Full circle, right? Being someone who's played Sonic 2 since I was a young child, I rarely have issues while playing it anymore. Once you get it down, Sonic 2 works great as a raw momentum based platformer, but I'd have to say it's probably the most frustrating out of the Genesis era 2D titles when it comes to unfairly punishing players. If you don't agree, I implore you to go back through it again and pay attention to how often the game tricks players into damage, death, or a complete loss of momentum. You might be just as surprised as I was because going into this review, I was excited to wax poetic about how great Sonic 2 is. Unfortunately, I have to say, this game is for experienced Sonic players only. But what do you guys think? Do you like Sonic 2? Is it your favorite game out of the 2D ones? If you like it more than Sonic 3 and Knuckles or Sonic Mania, why is that so? Sound off in the comments below, and I'll see you next time.